This time it's going from home to silence, and we'll have our Pledge of Allegiance to be led by a middle school student, uh, Finley Stubbs. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Would you take the lead on the Pledge of Allegiance? All right. I want to welcome everyone out to our board meeting tonight. Uh, so I want to welcome our SROs uh, with us tonight, our citizens, our parents, students, teachers, and administrators. Thank you, Avi. We certainly welcome each one of you out to our meeting tonight. Thanks for taking interest in Chester County School District students and exactly what's going on in our school district. So we do welcome you and thank you for uh, being here. Uh, at this time, we'll need the approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Motion being made and properly second. Any discussion? All in favor of the said motion, let me know. Saying aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. And it is unanimous. All right, we're down to our director take five is a new section that we added to our uh, agenda each week uh, where we get to hear from coordinators and directors throughout uh, our school district to give us updates. So at this time, we're going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Hazard. That sounds so strange. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Good evening. Good evening. the board, and Dr. Goodwin. I'm excited to tell you about a teacher recruitment initiative we began about three years ago called the NetServe Teacher Residency Program. A few things about the program. It is funded, excuse me y'all, something left my mind right quick. Yeah. It's funded uh, through a teacher partnership grant that we received for $3.9 million um, over a period of five years and it is also facilitated through Winthrop University. And the main focus of the grant is to prepare teachers to be able to teach in high need um, and poverty districts. Now, as you can see, there are several components about the program itself, but I want to highlight one major thing, which is job placement. And the reason I want to highlight that is because we actually have the opportunity to choose those educators to come to our district. So the candidates actually go through a rigorous process where they have to have an application, an interview, and we sit in on that. And once we choose them to come to our district, they complete their residency for a year, and then they are assigned to our district for three to five years. And the beauty of that is research tells us everywhere that if we can keep them three to five years, then they're apt to stay with us. And so not only is it teacher recruitment, but it's also teacher retention working at the same time through this program. When it comes to our residency allocation and match payments, we have already completed year one and year two of the program with absolutely no cost to the district. We're currently in year three of the program and we'll be paying a match of 25% with cohort three. When cohort four comes in in the final year, we will match 40%. So now let's talk about those residents. I'm proud to say that we um, finished up cohort one in 2021 with two residents and they were hired this year as first year teachers at Central High School. They're also in our teacher induction program currently. Cohort two residents, we have three of those currently, two at Cajun Elementary and one at Petersburg Primary. And cohort three residents will come in the fall, and we have three residents that will serve New Heights, Central, and Petersburg Primary. And finally, I put a slide in here showing you the type of recruitment and advertising that we do. This is a flyer that we post on the district website as well as the district Facebook page to help recruit um, candidates. Not only do we do this, but Winthrop does this on their end. And they actually do it in newspapers, 
and on radio stations as well. Currently, we have a couple of residents um, that came to our program to see these type of advertisements. And that's all I have for you tonight. Are there any questions? Any questions for Dr. Hazard? We certainly want to thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for your presentation tonight as well. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a good evening. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, at this time we're going to turn it over to Ms. Stubbs for our First Steps grant. Good to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Goodwin, uh, members of the board. Um, I would like to share with you um, the First Steps grant. Um, this is the Parent Child Plus grant. It is a collaborative grant with First Steps in the district. and. Um, we are currently, um, we are in year one. Um, this is a three-year grant. Um, and within this grant, um, our early learning specialists will be serving 30 to 35 families um, per cycle. And um, each family will have uh, participate in, in two cycles. Um, they will be following the parent-child uh, model and um, the, the, the early learning specialists go to the families and visit them twice a week for 30 minutes. And that's what really makes this program unique is that um, it is consistent and intensive um, a parenting tro program um, with, with the Parent Child Plus. One of the things that um, the early learning specialists and the site coordinators do is they, of course, have to participate in, in some intensive training beforehand. Um, and when they go into the homes, they bring either a toy or an educational toy. Um, and then they rotate those out each time that they come to visit. Um, along with that, they have activities um, for the parents and resources as well. This program will continue through the summer. Um, the purpose of the Parent Child Plus is to ensure that all children have equal possibilities from the start to support early literacy, school readiness, and early opportunities, to prepare children for academic success through intensive, consistent, long-term home visiting, and to share the love of learning. The model itself is pretty simple. The early learning specialists who share a community connection with families meet one-on-one -on -one with their parents and 16 to 48 month olds twice a week for 30 minutes. The early learning specialist arrives at the toddler's home with books and educational toys, and the early learning specialist and the parents sit with the child and engage in a joyous educational learning encounter together. So where are we right now? Um, like I said, we're in year one. The, the grant actually started in mid-January. Um, our early learning specialist and site coordinator have completed their initial training. They have been um, in and about the community with community outreach and involvement. They have already recruited their families. They are up to 32 families. Um, the toys and the books have been selected and purchased. Uh, they have started their home visits. They have gone in and, and done the, the first what they call intake with the family, that first assessment. So the home visits have started and we currently have a waiting list. Um, so that's been really exciting. This team has exceeded um, our expect expectations. Um, we are just amazed at what they have accomplished so far. Um, and I would like for our team, when I call their names, to stand up. In fact, I do want to mention this. The national organization has been so impressed with their work that they have asked this group to mentor to, to another site in the nation. So. They have really gone above and beyond. Um, so here's our team. Uh, Ms. Jackie Funderburk will be serving the Pageland area. She was not able to be with us tonight. Uh, Bobby Hoffman. Bobby is serving the Chesterfield and Macby area, and she is a, 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 a Macby girl. Um, Kalyn Keith. She will be serving the Sherall area, and she is also she is from Sherall. And Mr. Fred Davis is our site coordinator, and we um, certainly welcome him. He is a retired principal from North Carolina, so he brings a lot of knowledge and expertise to this team, and so we appreciate everything that they have done so far. 
And last but not least, um, Karen Martini Waller, um, the director of First Steps. Of course, we have been, um, just want to acknowledge all of her hard work and guidance and support in making this happen. So, any, any questions? questions for Ms. Stubbs? One question. What is a cycle? When you say a cycle, how long is that cycle? Three years. Sir? Uh, when you you said morning. that you'd be uh, working with families per cycle. You'd be working with them all year? Yes, yes. They'll do 23 weeks. They'll have, at the end of that 23 weeks, and, and again, that's twice a week, they will have a celebration, and then they'll do an additional 23 weeks. So it is a pretty intensive program. They really get to know these families and the children, and so they're, they're making those connections. But yes, two 23-week cycles. Okay. Mr. Coleman. What's the amount of this grant? The amount, dollar amount, it's a three-year grant. What is the amount? Um, I'll have to go back and look and let you know for sure, but I think it's in um, around maybe 700000 Does that sound right, Dr. Goodwin? It's, it's between 700000 and a million. And we were the second largest grant recipient in the state. And so with, with that, you know, comes the, the, with the grant was training, um, the, the resources for the families, the toys, books, you know, um, salaries for our site coordinator and early learning specialist. So, um, but I can let you know for uh, a definite amount. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Waiting list. Uh, how are your uh, families and children identified? Um, several different ways. Um, one way, the, the schools have helped us a lot because they know their families. And so they've been able to reach out. First Steps has been um, great at, at identifying families. Um, also, this group, they are out in the community and they're making connections. They are going, um, they've been to basketball games, they've been to community events, and they're just making connections with people they know. And so that's one reason I think they've been so successful, is that they have really, you know, gone out into communities and, and done, uh, they've been involved in some of the schools with literacy nights. So just lots of different ways. And the community can make Yes. Yes. We currently do have a waiting list. We have five families on the waiting list, and we're expecting more. So the word is getting out um, of the, the great job that they're doing. All right, Mr. Till. She just answered. Oh, she answered. Five on the waiting list. Okay. Yes, sir. Five. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Anybody else thank have questions? Thank you. Ms. Stubbs, thank you so thank much. You. We appreciate it. Thank you for that good news that you shared with us. All right. At this time, we'll turn it over to Dr. Hoffman for uh, ESOL overview. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Goodwin. It has been a long time since I've been up here. Um, it feels a little weird. So, um, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about our English as a Second Language program, which you may, we refer to as our ESOL program. I, the way that wanted to start it off with letting you know how we identify students in this program, all students that are enrolling in South Carolina schools have to fill out a home language survey. And on that home language survey, there are three questions that are asked. The first one is, what is the language that the student first acquired? The second is, what language is spoken most often by the student? And the third is, what is the primary language used in the home, regardless of the language spoken by the student? If a parent answers any of these questions with any language other than English, we have to screen that student to see if they qualify for our ESOL services. On the next slide, I've given you just an overview of the levels of proficiency. Of course, we have some students in our district that are at the um, level one, which means they come to us speaking no English. Uh, and you can see the levels as they progress. I've given you the levels. Um, they have a name for that placement. How often it is recommended that they receive ESOL services and what kind of classroom accommodations are given. Of course, those students who are our ones um, need some pretty extensive classroom accommodation and need to be um, served with our ESOL teachers as much as we can. All right. 
The next slide tells you how many students we have, and they're called ML students. They like to change the name of the students every year, so um, now they're calling them multilingual language learners. And right now, we have 246 students. I broke it down so you could see the numbers by school. Um, of course, our Pageland area has um, the highest numbers. Uh, MACB has um, the next highest numbers. But I will tell you, we are seeing an increase in the Chesterfield area of students um, coming in um, over the past, since Christmas. Um, we've had five or six students who have enrolled um, in those schools. To serve those students, we have six teachers that serve those four attendance areas. Of course, we have the most that are serving in the Pageland and, and MACB area. We have one that is serving in the Chesterfield, um, Sherrill area also. Um, these teachers help each other and if, if needed, they work very well together. And they're all certified. All right, our last slide, as I round it up, is I just wanted to show you that in our district, we have nine different languages that are represented. Now, all of these students are not served in our ESOL program. Some of them are, um, are just um, students who come from homes that um, may speak Spanish and they have tested out of the program or did not test into the program to begin with. But Spanish, of course, is our number one. Our second largest is Arabic. We have a pretty large Arabic population in Pageland at um, New Heights and at Central. And then you can go along and see um, some of them, of the languages, I try to pronounce them in my southern <laughs> accent, just doesn't sound right. Um, <laughs> but most, <laughs> most of them are um, Indian um, and Philippine um, languages. And of course we have our um, Chinese and Vietnamese. Any questions for Dr. Hoffman? I, I don't have any questions, but I do have a, a statement. Looking at the demographics at the level at each school, it's amazing your high school has more than actually almost three times as much as your primary and middle schools. And so I'm wondering how that trend gonna go because if, if I look at Central High School, it's 52. And if I look at the elementary schools, I think most of them have two and three at most. Uh, so it, it, it definitely kind of says the landscape is gonna be changing very quick. It, but it, I'm wondering uh, with the growth of some of these areas, particularly uh, the Payton area, uh, I, I can see that trend continue to grow in those primary and uh, middle schools. It does, and I can tell you that we do have a lot of students that enroll in our middle and high school, um, high schools that are, are coming with parents that are coming into the country for the first time. Um, some may not have been in school for a while. Um, and, but you know, when they're here, they are enrolled in our school system, so. Any other questions? Okay, all right, all right. Hoffman, thank you so much for your thank presentation. You. Thank mm -hmm. you. Interesting information, thank you. All right, moving right along. At this time, we'll call on our Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Brad Willard, to give us our budget update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, good evening. Good evening. Good, evening. good one as well. Uh, you may recall uh, the last board meeting a couple of weeks ago, we brought to you some budget information um, as well as we knew it at the time based on the Ways and Means Committee as they were meeting and going through the process. Um, I can't say that I'm going to follow up all that good news that you just heard with more good news, uh, but we're not going to get too in depth or in the weeds this evening as far as our numbers and what we look like overall because quite simply the house budget projections were just released late last week um, actually so late that they still have not been posted to the state website so we're taking what we have giving you some additional information about what we know regarding the policy change in the new funding model and how that may translate into our finances when we dig into the 22-23 budget 
and we hope by the time we get to the work session uh, at the end of April, we will have a good bit more information based on Senate Finance Committee, et cetera, uh, to bring to you. So this evening, uh, what you have in your portal, and I apologize to everyone viewing here that this is uh, somewhat hard to read, but we will do the best we can and uh, walk you through this, and hopefully we can get a good understanding of what's going on. So based on the House budget projections, what I wanted to show you, the top portion of this first chart is, a, is an identical reproduction of what the State Department produces for us to tell us what our projections are based on the House models. So this model will tell you that we're receiving an additional $2.8 million over the 21-22 current budget as it stands. Now, you may recall the last meeting we told you that the uh, governor's plan as modified somewhat by the Ways and Means Committee was producing an additional 1.6 million. Well, what this model does is also takes into consideration a couple of items or a few items that are not in the new funding model. And I will take those out and we'll drill down to that in just a moment. But what it also does is it includes fringe that was not included in the previous model. So it's not identical to what you've been seeing um, because of those factors. So this is going to show you a few items, again, four items that are receiving additional monies this year. Student health and fitness, reading coaches, retiree insurance, and career and technology education, which is the EIA portion of that grant. The bottom section of this chart you will see again on the next one because what I want to emphasize this evening is how the shift of the EIA components that are being consolidated into the new funding model impacts our budget. Okay? So we're going to move right on to the next one because that's where the real part of our discussion this evening needs to take place. So the top part of this chart, I've taken those items out that, are, that have their own funding sources under the new model still. Student health and fitness, reading coaches, Kate, EIA portion, and then the other one was the um, retiree insurance. Those are not involved in the new funding model. So you're gonna see all of these line items had a budget in the 2021 year as sent to the district. Those all go to zero. What we now have is a budget distribution philosophy under the new model that gives us one lump sum with a portion of that broken into general fund and a portion of that in EIA, with the lion's share obviously being general fund. That is how the $227 million package through the House is being distributed to districts. General fund, EIA, with the consolidation of many items. So, with that said, if we take out those that have their own line item, then the new funding model arguably then provides to us about $2.5 million of additional funding over the current year. However, what we need to remember is those EIA components that are being consolidated and rolled up into the new funding model, which are listed on the bottom half of this chart, at risk, fund 338, aid to districts, fund 397, and then your teacher salary supplement items, which are the salary portion and the fringe portion, are now moving to general fund. So, Fund 338 and 397 historically have been paid out of EIA. We will now, when we present you the budget, come May and June, those expenses will be in the general fund budget. And we will have the flexibility to transfer that reven those revenues into the general fund budget. And we're gonna have to because we've gotta cover the expenses. The other two lines, the teacher salary supplement and the teacher salary supplement fringe, just for disclosure, those have already been transferred from EIA to general fund in the past. 
because those are meant to cover general fund expenses. But they cannot, they, they haven't been able to give it to us that way in the past. So what we have to understand is out of two and a half million dollars of additional funding that may be created by the new funding model to Chesterfield County School District, we have to take $1,448,000 worth of expenses and cover that. Keeping in mind that all of those revenue streams for those four items are being cut on average statewide 25%. Again, I'll remind you, historically EIA funding has been 100% from the state. It is now being uh, we are now being required to match that statewide on average, 75% state, 25% local districts. Chesterfield County, because of our poverty and index of tax payability, we will remain at about 82% and 18%. So that's why I have uh, put in here that we would expect to still have to pay 18% of those two lines from local dollars. So bottom line is, Estimated true net revenue under the new funding plan is a little over a million dollars. And I would say, at this point in time, with a lot of questions, a lot of variables out there, that we cannot take that amount of money and implement what is in the policy. When you talk about increases to teacher salary schedules, fringe, increased employer cost, not to mention other items that we want to address under our budget. What are our other needs? So what we wanted to do this evening with those two slides is give you an idea of what we think we're looking at right now based on house projections. And while it does appear we, like other districts, are receiving more money under the new funding plan as a percentage, maybe more than what we have in prior years, We've got to look at all the facts, and I urge you to uh, ask questions, um, take the information we give you, uh, help us to uh, get explanations and uh, details upon that as we go through the process. So as we close this evening, the only thing that Dr. Goodwin and I wanted to do was put in front of you some questions and concerns that we have as we go through this process. And a lot of these are the reasons why we cannot dig into our budget prep system and start developing concrete numbers at this point. What's the true intent of legislation and guidance for the teacher salary increase? Well, there, there are a lot of answers out there for that. Is it a true $4,000 increase to salary? Or is it an increase to the teacher salary schedule, taking the minimum starting pay to $40,000? And as of earlier this afternoon, when we had uh, the, the opportunity to listen to a press conference, uh, we feel like the answers to that are becoming more clear, where we need to focus on where the starting pay is, and it is not a $4,000 increase to each teacher's pay. But it's still a question. We still have to go through the Senate process. The same can be said for the bus driver salary increase to their schedule. What's the intent of legislation and guidance? Don't forget the 1% employer retirement increase. What's the real impact of that? What are the true numbers? What is the statewide teacher count? What is the average student teacher ratio that's going to be used by the time we get to the end of this? Um, budget session. It's already changed a little bit a couple of times. How do we offset the local match that's now required for those EIA funds? That extra 18% we have to come up with for those items. 18% employer health increase is pretty stout, folks. Uh, one like we've never seen. Um, we have been told that there is funding that is built in for this, but uh, arguably it's not going to be enough to, to touch what ends up being a half year impact starting January 1st of about 9% because that's a calendar year adjustment, not a fiscal year adjustment. And again, how do we address budget needs other than what's being mandated in the plan? 
schedules outside of teachers and certified categories that are being being addressed in the new funding plan? How do we deal with the reduction of the CTE weighting going from 1.9 to 1? And how do we deal with the elimination of the dual enrollment add-on weighting? Those are just listing a lot of variables and questions, things that Dr. Goodwin and I could think of as we were preparing this so that you're aware of what we're going to be looking into and what we'll be dealing with as we go through the process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all that I have for this evening. Any questions from board members? Yes, was there any anticipated uh, state raise for employees across the board at this point? Uh, well, we do not fall under the state employee um, legislation. I think, Dr. Goodwin, if I'm not mistaken, 3% was what was uh, in legislation for state employees, but that does not uh, cover district employees. From a point of legislation, we're not considered state employees. Is that fair to say, Dr. Goodwin? Yes. Sir. Do you know of anything different? The only thing is the convolution of bus drivers. The bus drivers. The bus drivers could schedule. be subject not only to the 3%, but then also the 5% that the State Department is saying. So they could be looking at as much as an 8% adjustment. Okay. To the schedule. To think. the schedule. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? This is still in the House. Uh, no, the House has passed their The House has passed their budget and it's over to the Senate now. It, it is, and just to give you an idea of their schedule, the Senate Finance Committee will be meeting the week of April 11th uh, to take up their portion. Then you have some subcommittee meetings. Full Senate debate I don't think takes place until the week of our uh, work session, but we hope to have more information out of the committees by that time. Based on the House budget as it is, do you have an idea? You just told us all this information. you have an idea of what it would cost us if things stayed as they are? I don't at this time. Okay. Too, too many variables related to those schedules to even do uh, projections from salary and friend standpoint, which makes up 89% of our budget. So. Any other questions? All right, here and none, Mr. Willow, we appreciate your report. Thank you. Appreciate the work that your team uh, is doing on our budget as well. All right, at this time we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Anderson, our Assistant Superintendent of Personnel for our uh, personnel exhibits. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, at this time I'd like to recommend the following exhibits for your approval, exhibits A through F. So move. Second. Second. Motion made and properly second. Any discussion? All in favor of the said motion, let me know saying aye. 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 All opposed, light sign. And it is unanimous. Dr. Goodwin? A couple of introductions. Yes, sir, please. Okay, uh, in those um, exhibits tonight, uh, we do have a, a few different uh, administrative positions being uh, approved. Uh, first, I'd like to have Miss Angie Tucker, if she would stand where everybody can see her. Miss Angie Tucker has been serving as the interim principal at Jefferson Elementary since January. And uh, she has, uh, with the action tonight of the board, she has been named the principal of uh, Jefferson Elementary. Congratulations. And she shared with us uh, in the process a lot of different initiatives that she already has in place. And to say she's hit the ground running would be a definite understatement. Also, over on the side, trying to hide over in the corner tonight, Ms. Carolyn Caldwell has been serving as our interim principal at Macby High School since uh, during the month of July. She went into the fire right, right off uh, and she is uh, happy to announce her as the principal of Macby High School. Congratulations, Ms. Caldwell. Likewise, Ms. Caldwell has uh, been able to, to lay a lot of groundwork this year. We always tell new principals to make sure you take a good bit of time to learn your school before you make a lot of adjustments. She says she's ready to make adjustments now, is what she said. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. She waited till she got the job. She <laughs> waited till she got the job. She <laughs> wasn't going to give away her secrets. <laughs> uh, also tonight's action, uh, Dr. Judd Starling, who has been with our adult education program uh, for the past six years, uh, the action of the board tonight names him the new director of adult education for Chesterfield County. And uh, 
He has been an integral part of that program now for those six years, and no doubt he will continue to move it forward. So, uh, and I think he's actually teaching tonight is why he could not be with us. So I saw a couple of heads shake yes. Finally, uh, Mr. Jamie Brown. Mr. Jamie Brown is currently the assistant principal here at Long Middle School, but by action of the board tonight, he is the new director of transportation and safety officer for the district. And uh, he'll be making the move to Ruby officially July 1st, but he's gonna have to get his feet wet before then because uh, there's a lot to, to get prepared for next year uh, in the transportation department. And we welcome him to that new role uh, I know that he has already contacted a number of other state transportation directors because during the process he shared a number of things that he's already gleaned that, that will be uh, easily applied to our district, which will make our operation even better. So welcome, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I think that concludes my introduction. And as you can see, we are excited to be able to um, promote from within. So we're excited to be able to do that. Congratulations to each one of, of you that we recognize tonight. Uh, you've been doing a great job, and we know you're going to continue to do that. At this time, we'll turn it over to our Executive Director of Curriculum, Ms. Wendy Folsom. Good evening, Mr. Good evening. Chairman. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Goodwin, members of the board, I'd like to highlight a few items from your March 22 curriculum report. Our junior scholars have taken a new trip this year. I've got some pictures to share with you. Um, we contacted Coker College and actually had our junior scholars in the ninth grade um, visit Coker in March. Also, our junior scholars, no, excuse me, ninth grade junior scholars went to York Technical College. Beth, it was our 10th graders that went to Coker back in March. So we were excited to offer them a new trip. Um, and we have pictures up for you to see. I'd like to also highlight our adult education. And I, w I had to go to um, Ms. Jacobs and ask her because as of your report, she had 30 graduates. As of today, she has 35 graduates. So I want to really give her a, a shout out for that. Um, they are working really hard to, to get our people recruited and registered and get them through classes. Um, We've had um, GED graduates, but as well as high school diploma graduates. And that makes me very proud. Those con that concludes my remarks for tonight. And I've heard they're aiming for 50, so um, be interesting Can you do it, it Ms. Jacobs? Yes. Yes. She, was here. she sorry, says Ms. yes. <laughs> All right, Mr. Coleman. What is this? 55. 55. 55. Oh. Didn't mean to lower the bar. Sorry about that. <laughs> what I was told anyway. Ms. Folsom, I'm looking at oh, your, yes, your, your virtual school. You got 216 countywide. And I was looking at your data chart, if I'm reading it correct, you have 100 based on ethnicity, 123 enrolled, is that correct? Yes, for your totals down I, at the bottom. And then when I go to my far left, I'm looking at gender, male, you got 113, is that correct? That's what it looks like based on this chart. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot. Heavy of males. Well, about half. I mean, if you're thinking 216, 113 being males. And, more, and, and most of those, if I'm looking at your ethnicity of 123, so the majority of those would be black males out of the 113, correct? Do yeah. we have it broken down by ethnicity males? Well, you got. Your gender, well, first of all, you got, right. two, you got 216 countywide. Correct. You got, based on ethnicity, 123 of, I mean, 123 of the 216. 123 is of the 216. And when you go to the gender, which is 113, I thought that was kind of interesting if you're looking at the data, if I'm reading that correct. You see what I'm saying? I just noticed that that's kind of jumped out at me when I see well, 216 total, 123 black, and then the male is 113. It has to tell me the majority of the 123 got to be black male. Yep. And 
Is that, is I, there, is, I, am I, I looking at that correct? Yes, sir. I agree with you completely. And in, in since we put in the virtual program uh, last year, we have seen a, a, a higher percentage of African-American students who have chosen to go virtual, whose families have. So, okay. yes, I, I believe that you're, you're, what you're saying is true without having the actual data in front of me. I'm going to guess you're right. Okay. I just thought that was interesting. And, and because I do know we do give them choice, correct? Yes. Correct. I mean, it's but, their but, choice. Yeah. But I, I, my, my, my point is how much of, an, of, of, of guiding those choices because, you know, we all know virtual school is, is, is challenging for some. I, I just thought that that was just so, you know, if, that, if, if, if I'm making any sense, I just thought the data was right. very interesting and, and to see. And based on your guidance, what would you suggest? How much of a school district are we kind of helping these choices to be made with these students? I know we kind of leave it open-ended, but I'm speaking from, and by no means I'm not addressing a race issue. I just thought that was just very obvious because I do know a lot of black males struggle uh, in areas, especially I do know, see, see, I see that firsthand, but to see this type of data, I mean, that's, that's kind of alarming to me. Not that anybody in the school district is doing anything wrong, but I just thought that was out of 216, looking at the breakdown was, was an eye catcher for me. Yes, sir. I will say that this year we have done a much better job of monitoring how the students are doing grade-wise, attendance-wise. We are staying in touch with families. We are, you know, we have brought back a lot of our virtual students that have not done well. We've encouraged parents to, you know, let them come back into the school buildings. So I think that monitoring it and, and keeping the lines of communication open and asking parents to bring kids back that are not doing well with the virtual option okay. has been positive. I would like to see the report of those students who are not doing well in our virtual option. Right yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we certainly can. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Ms. Thank Sweeney. you. Mm -hmm. Two questions. <clears throat> and I saw that same statistic too. Virtual school students take, uh, just like we finished the MAP test here like a week or two ago, do they take that MAP test? Are we able to monitor them as they go along in the, in the virtual yes, school? Yes, we do not offer an at-home MAP testing. We ask the parents to bring them in and they come in and take MAP testing at the same time other students do. Now, we, if, if parents would like, we've given them a separate place to test um, to make the parents more comfortable, but we do ask them to come in for MAP testing. We get good participation, do you know, when they Our come participation in? has been very good. I have not had any complaints that, are, that we've had any refusals this year. Last year, we had more refusals. Okay, now let me move to my second point. Um, the after school program, and I, I, and I would use Long Middle School as an example, the after school program uh, where we have uh, tutoring going on, one subject, I think here, social studies on Mondays, English, Tuesday, math, Wednesday, Thursday, science, that has been a very big plus for the district. Heard a lot of comments about it, uh, and it's helping students. I am wondering now, are we going to be able to offer that during the summer? Because a lot of those students, when we went to virtual school in 20, 2021, uh, when we was in virtual school, basically lost a year. Uh, and, and a lot of them are struggling. You take an eighth grade or a seventh grade that didn't pick up sixth grade math or seventh grade math or whatever the case is, they're struggling. So this after school program is assisting them. My point is, will we be able to offer that type, since we have this extra money here, summer school for those who fail the subject and what have you to be able to go back in the group? Yes, sir. So we got two of them that's going on. We got two, two summer programs actually going on. We have our 4K through eighth grade uh -huh. through our middle schools, and then we do credit content recovery for our high right. schools. Okay, we're good. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I want to start off first by saying I, I think y'all doing a great job. Uh, certainly keep it up. Um, and I, I was just listening and I said, wow, with the um, presentation that Ms. Stubbs gave mm -hmm. with first steps, uh, I'm thinking 
like Mr. Coleman said, with, with that roll up of statistical data and the outreach service that we're doing with the first steps. Uh, I wonder is there any blended services like uh, some of these students may also be a part of that first step program since so you say it's 4K through 8th grade? Is, is for summer, a, for our summer program? Well, well, I'm speaking of Ms. Stubbs' presentation mm -hmm. and how does that support uh, the uh, data that, that you just went over uh, with, those, with those virtual students. Let's say that I'm a virtual student and my grades are not really that good or even my grades are good, but whenever the first step coordinator or person go out to their home, they see that there need to be some intervention. Yes, is, is in, in fact, they've the done district? a great job of communicating with the district. Right. When they've been in homes and, and seen other needs for older students, yeah. they've actually reached out to us. Okay, um, yeah, and that's what I was hoping, that there was some blended services going on and some identification of a, a need for, for additional services based on that uh, first step program going out to their home. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right. Okay. So thank, thank you. you thank you, Ms. Wilson. <laughs> All right. At this time, we'll turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Goodwin, for his uh, superintendent report. Okay. First, I would like to give a big shout out to number one, Dr. Hoffman and her team in our federal programs department. But then that goes then to every department within the district, and then uh, to each of our principals. Uh, we underwent a federal uh, consolidated federal programs audit this year. That would have been Title One, Two three, four, and six, five, and, okay, one, two, three, four, and five, which we've never done that. This is the first time that the state has done this, where they've consolidated all those audits into one. Uh, to, to say it added a little extra stress would be an understatement, <coughs> but I am happy to report that they came through this audit very, very clean uh, with some recommendations of things. Uh, they're never going to come and, and review your stuff without recommending something. But uh, they, they did a very, very good job of pulling all that together. And they are to be congratulated and thanked for their hard work on that. Um, your procurement reports that we provide you each year, which are sole source, emergency uh, procurement, as well as minority vendor reports, are in your portal. Uh, I would caution you before you look at those that there are more of those than typical, but we've been dealing with uh, a pandemic. Uh, these go back uh, back into the meat of the pandemic. So when we had to have certain items, we had to have them right now in a lot of cases. And that was the way it was with all of the state, but uh, that gives you a, a picture. One comment I would make about the minority vendor report is, Remember, they only show up on the minority vendor report if they are a registered minority vendor. And very few of our minority vendors in this region of the state actually register as a minority vendor. Therefore, we have few numbers, even though if you go in and look at the individual vendors that we have that serve us, you'll notice we have a, quite a large number of minority-owned vendor uh, companies. But Again, they have to register for us to be able to put them on the list. Of course, yes. percentage-wise, in terms of dollars spent, what are we talking about? Uh, on a, on a uh, minority yeah. vendor? Yeah. Very, very low because I think we only have four registered minority vendors. Now, that's in this region. Do we do state and regional? Uh, that's, that's anybody we purchase from within the United States, actually. If they report back to us, they're a registered minority vendor, they show up on the list. And that's, of course, minority as far as ethnic minority as well as women-owned business. Yeah, well, I'm speaking of yeah. black folks. I, I understand. But I'm saying very few register as minority vendors now. Uh, because, of course, under procurement laws, there is no advantage to them is why they don't report. The uh, teacher of the year list is in the portal. Uh, we are in the process now of, of working through the district level uh, part. So we are, are going through that. A reminder that the schools are closed April 11th through the 18th. The district office is closed the 14th through the 18th. And then there are some upcoming dates there for the uh, teacher of the year banquet, 
the retirement banquet and the adult ed graduation. Mr. Chair, I think that concludes my remarks. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. I remind the board members, March 30th, which is Wednesday, my mm. wife's birthday, uh, your statement of economic interest are due. I uh, just did mine this weekend, matter of fact, so don't forget that. They will find us and won't back down from it, I promise. Uh, April 4th, we'll have a board meeting at the Palmer Learning Center at 5 o'clock. Uh, also, April 25th, a special board meeting at the Palmer Learning Center as well. April the 27th is the day at the Capitol, so if you're going to register for that event, you need to let Ms. Patsy know uh, by the 4th. Does she have to register then? Yes. Okay, so let Ms. Patsy know by, by the 4th. All right, that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting. Uh, we certainly appreciate each one of you attending tonight. Thank you to uh, Ms. Ellerby. Uh, and your staff for all your hospitality and things that you did in order to uh, have us here tonight. We certainly thank you for hosting uh, the meeting for us. At this time, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. second. Motion is made and properly second. All in favor say a motion. Let me know I'm saying aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. And we're done. <laughs>